All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Make sure you subscribe to see more cool interviews like the one that you're about to watch. Now, things are going to be a little different today because our guest is joining us via the phone from France, of all places. And so we are going to find out what happened with Phantom Blue. We're going to find out why she's in France. Nicole Couch, right after this. All right, so here we are. Joining me on the phone from the band Phantom Blue, Nicole Couch. Phantom who? <laughs> Phantom who? Nobody, nobody's heard of us. Phantom, hey, well, oh, Phantom who oh, would be a good spinoff. Yeah, Phantom who? Or who did, <laughs> never mind. But yeah, Phantom Blue. Well, you know, Nicole, yes, Phantom Blue might seem a bit obscure, but the way I look at it is, People who clicked on this video, they obviously know um, who Phantom Blue You know, I kind of like the obscurity, you know? Well. We're kind of like an unknown kind of thing. Well, we're going to find out more because in a lot of ways, I feel like that's the uh, life that you pursued. Um, so, but let's, let's go back first. So you're born in Chicago, right? I was born in Ilan, um, let's see, blah, 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 Peru, which is about three miles south of Chicago. So, Illinois. Yeah, it just sounds cooler. Um, Peru, Illinois. Yeah. Okay. And so, how long did you live there? Um, not too long. And then my dad went down south to Mississippi because he went to law school at Ole Miss. So, um, maybe a few months until my dad got into law school. So I really am not a native, I guess. He, I don't really know the area. I went to Chicago a lot when I would go up to visit my grandmother, so. Gotcha, okay. And so, and yeah. then, but you really, you really grew up in, in near Memphis, right, Tennessee? Yeah, I, I grew up right in Northern Mississippi, right on the borderline of Mississippi and Tennessee. So I had access to both states really i went to school in memphis and played in bands in memphis and lived in mississippi yeah and you, you, you piano was the first instrument you learned right yeah piano is my favorite and so you're, you're 12 years old when you first start playing guitar is, is that right mm-hmm and so, you know, it's really different nowadays. Every kid can go on YouTube or read tabs. And, and so, and not that it's necessarily a bad thing, but it, it's much more difficult to learn at that time. So tell me what the early lessons are like. You know, I, I'm really lucky that I went to a Catholic school in Mississippi and they had an excellent music program where you start learning to read music and you are required to play an instrument. So that was really beneficial. And I've used that my entire life and later on pursued a teaching career because it's really important to me that all children everywhere have a music education in any form, whether it's an instrument or something shitty like the recorder, mm -hmm. just something. Yeah, well, and we're gonna get to some of your um, your teaching stuff later. So okay, so you're 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 playing guitar and you start playing around town in Mississippi. You're playing in bars and things, right? I was actually singing, not playing guitar. But um, as I got older and a driver's license, I found a bunch of musicians in Memphis, and so I would skip school and kind of head up to Memphis and just hang out and smoke cigarettes with older musicians and drink shitty beer and play in bands. That's usually how most people seem to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cigarettes is optional, but the rest of it seems to be yeah. a, a prerequisite. And so is it true that you heard about uh, Michael Jackson audition around this time? Um, around this time, I hadn't left for California yet. Um, I was... Once I really started getting into guitar, I really knew that I didn't want to pursue college. 
or anything of that nature. So I found GIT mm-hmm. when reading um, a guitar player magazine one day and Mike Varney and decided that's where I want to go. So I left Mississippi and just went to California and got to GIT and well, this, and this is, was like that's a big that's a big move. So, what what was your what was your plan? Did you have money? Did you have a place to stay? No, no, I had nothing. I um, I had a silver plated flute that I was playing in my high school band. I got my GED and got enrolled in GIT and pawned my flute and just hopped on an airplane and got off at L- the air playing at LAX with like a dollar 83 in my pocket. Mm. And my, my best friend who went with me spent it on a freaking Hagen dazs bar. I'm like, damn, that was it. <laughs> and I'm not even hungry. Um, so we just kind of like were the typical, like crazy teenage girls runaways and stayed here and there. And then my father was like, look, you've got to, you know, be serious and get into school. And so he got me an apartment and I got into school and took GIT very seriously. And it all happened from there. But did, uh, you know, it's not like these days where you can ask somebody to PayPal you or, uh, you know, or Venmo or whatever, you, you know, it's, wh- wh- and where were you going to go live? Um, You know, I just, wanted to get out there so bad I just at that age I was just fearless and so so and back then they had those um like I was always it seemed like I was like always at 7-eleven and someone sold me <laughs> a some kind of number for like ten dollars where I could call home for nothing oh right yeah they had those illegal but but they used to have those died, calling so. cards but they had Western Union back then, so my dad sent me money, and I lived in this boarding house with like twenty other people, and worked across the street at McDonald's, and okay, then so. eventually got up to Hollyweird, and yeah, and so okay, well, so you 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 get this, you get money together, you're working, you're staying in Hollyweird, and uh, you go to GIT, Paul Gilbert. He's one of your instructors, right? Yes. Paul Gilbert. Well, actually, no, Bruce, Bruce Bruce was my instructor first. And a buddy of mine wanted to switch. He, oh, wait, wait, let me, let me go over this. Mm-hmm. I'm old. So let me think. I had Bruce, right? Yeah. And this other kid had Paul. And this friend of mine at GIT wanted to switch. And so he paid me 20 bucks and he got Bruce and I got Paul. So it was awesome. Yeah. And we should point out, so they were both in the band Racer X at the time. They were on the Shrapnel Records label. Uh, later, right. Paul goes on to be a big star uh, in Mr. Big. And so, and I, and I believe you had a crush on Paul at the time. Is that right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh, you found out about that. <laughs> well, I've, I've even found out you named your cat after him. I did. <laughs> That's a funny story too. He actually met the cat, and and I made my band change the cat's name like within minutes of Paul showing up, <laughs> so he wouldn't find out. Right, but but what if somebody would have called him, and then the cat would have been confused? Right. <laughs> so there, there probably isn't much of a better teacher than, than Paul Gilbert. Mm, yeah, right. Is it getting better? Yeah, so. and and so, at, at what, what level was your playing on when you started at GIT? Um, it was terrible, actually. Really, really. And you're still um, a kid, right? I mean, were you were you even eighteen? Uh, yeah, I was. I was seventeen, okay. and probably better than I thought I was. Well, no, I thought I was better than I actually was. And then I get to GIT and it's like, oh, God, I've got so much to learn. And then I became obsessed with the whole shred thing. And he, like right. I was, pardon? No, I was saying, right, that was getting big at the time. 
Yeah. But like when I was asked to audition for Michael Jackson, the um, head of admissions, I think it was, said, you know, you have to be able to play finger tapping. I'm like, oh, well, that excludes me. And then she said, Jennifer Batten will be my, you know, competition. I'm like, I'm going to just say no and not embarrass myself. So that was that. But that probably motivated you too, right? Um, that and just wanting to play like Paul, really. Mm -hmm. And thinking if I got really good, he'd marry me. <laughs> well, you got really good. The marriage didn't work out, but... No, but you know he was a huge fan of Phantom Blue, and he actually played with us at a few shows in LA. So that that's probably better than marriage. <laughs> that yeah, well, that will last forever. Marriage, I'm not so sure about. True. Um, so at, at, while you're at GIT, is this where you meet Michelle for the first time? Yep. Yeah, there was a guy there who played. He was at BIT. He was a bass player. And he knew me pretty well. And he's like, gosh, I know this girl. She's your twin. And she just loves Racer X. And she's an amazing guitar player. So I called her and we just hit it off right away. And she shows up at my apartment in Hollywood. And she played my guitar. And I was like, oh, my God. She's, she, she was just amazing. And then we started going to Race Direct shows, and that was it. Yeah, so now this is probably, is this 87 or 88? Um, I would say 80, 87, yeah, 87. And so, you know, Hollywood's huge at this time with bands. Were you a fan of the bands on the scene? Were you going out a lot? No, no, really, I can count on the number, on, my, on one hand, the number of times I went out. Basically, I was four. Second, I was really serious about guitar. And third, I'm an introvert, so I don't go out. But we just had to see every Racer X show there ever was at the country club. They, um, we never saw them on the strip, I don't believe. It was always the country club in Reseda. Yeah, and it was probably easier to get in there with your age. Probably. You know, I don't ever recall having a problem with that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was definitely a different time too. Cause I talked to people at the time who were saying, you know, they were 17 and playing bars, you know, back then, which was going to be you eventually. Supposedly we were, um, yeah, I think some of the clubs on the strip used to like make an issue about our age, but for the most part, it wasn't a problem. So you and Michelle have the idea to put together Phantom Blue, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole concept was to have a female racer X since we both played guitar. Right. And wanted the whole dual lead shred thing. And the same guy that hooked me and Michelle up said, look, I know this girl who sings. And so that was Gigi Hangyak and... She auditioned, and it was just we were just like, "Wow, this is just perfect," because mm -hmm. she had that really dirty, gravelly voice with a lot of power. So, and Michelle knew Linda, the drummer. Okay, gotcha. So she, so so you're getting there. You have four of the components now. Mm -hmm. And so tell, yeah. and, and so, and then you need a bass player. So tell me uh, where you meet her. I, I do not remember. I think I read that I she was don't. a student of John, who was Racer X's bass player, I believe. That was our second bass player who replaced the first bass player. She was a student of John's because he referred her to us. Did, it's funny. So did, 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 did Our first bass player, I don't know. I just don't remember. Did these guys like Paul know that you, you guys wanted to be the, fe the female Racer X? They must have known. When we started the early stages, I don't think they had any idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I, Paul pretty much figured it out right away after hearing the album because he really was a fan. So, yeah. And, and Bruce was the one who got us 
the record deal with Bernie. So, yeah. So, for people watching, I'm sure most would know, but Mike Varney had a label called Shrapnel Records, and uh, this was where the, he, you know, he discovered Ingve Malmsteen, brought him over to the states, and he had, you know, Cacophony, Jason Becker, Marty Friedman. Uh, Racer X, Paul Gilbert, Bruce Bouillet. So the, the really, he he was bringing shredding to the to the as close to mainstream as you can. I think it started as ads, you know, in the guitar magazines where you can order these things. Right. Um, I mean, he really owns that genre. He really does. Yeah, and so I'm trying genre, to not genre, genre, genre. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get him to come on. He's a little shy, but uh, I talked to him yesterday, and he said to say hello to you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> So. Mike's not shy. Well, I think he's shy about being uh, uh, telling these stories publicly. You know, what I mean, people can tell you great stories right. in a bar, and then you go, "Okay, now we're going to put it on YouTube," and then all of a sudden, um, they get a little tight-lipped. But uh, but we'll see. I right. think I think he'll I think he'll do oh, it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, you're you're hi you're in hiding. You're you're set. No, nobody has it. Uh, you know, no no one's going to uh, uh, bother with you. You're you're set. Um, so, okay, so you guys start rehearsing, and I know you're really serious about it. Aren't you rehearsing like six days a week? I don't know if it was six days, but we started out, you know, because we, the songwriting in the beginning took a while because it was just me and Michelle, and I had never written before, so that was very time-consuming. And then getting our singer to keep coming to the rehearsals because we had nothing for her at first. It was just the music. And so she was getting bored. So I was just trying to, you know, keep everything together. And then one day, stupid me, I met a NAM show and Russ Parrish mm -hmm. from Satchel, right? Yeah, yeah he, he became he Satchel. At G yeah, he was a student at GIT at the time and I knew he was in Nepal. I think he was living in the same apartment complex as me and Paul, and he played just like him pretty much. And then I'm at a NAM show, and he's like, hey, Nick, you know, what's up with your band? And I'm like, oh, well, we're good. We got signed to Shrapnel. And then I realized, oh, fuck, no, we didn't get signed to Shrapnel. So I just kind of told my band, you know, we need to get a demo done, because I had to cover my ass, <laughs> really. So me and Michelle booked some studio time and we went into a studio somewhere in LA and did a four or five song demo in like 10, 13 hour, hours and gave a tape to Bruce Bouillet and said, could you give this to Mike? And so Bruce was like, yeah, sure. So we never heard from Mike. We were like, oh, what happened? So our bass player, the first bass player, who was the grown-up, called Mike. I don't know how she got his number, but she called him and said, hey, what did you think of our demo? And Mike said, you know, I was really excited about this demo because of what Bruce told me, and I'm ready to listen to it, and I pop it into my cassette player on the plane, and it's blank. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we we rush out to FedEx and get him an a actual tape with material on it, and he calls us. And I'll not, I still remember the day sitting in my apartment in Hollywood. And he's like, "Ooh, why don't we do a deal?" Cause I don't know. You've talked to Mike. He kind of sure. sounds like Barney Rubble. Yeah, I think that that's pretty, yeah accurate. Yeah. So that was that, and within months we were up in Kotati recording. Well, how amazing though! So you're basically trying to brag, and you make up a record deal that doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, trying to talk tough. Nowadays you couldn't do that. People would go online in one second and bust you, but you probably figured out. Oh, I'll right. just say this: What's he gonna know? Uh, and <laughs> and then you so to cover yourself, why not go out and actually get the record deal? A and you did. Yeah, it, it all worked out. I have to thank Russ one of these days. Yeah, um, yeah. And we, so we should point out that Russ uh, Parrish, we you know, he went on to play with Rob Halford and fight, but um, Satchel in Steel Panther, he's that uh, he's that character. So okay, so you know, an interesting thing we're talking about the making of the of the record. You wrote or co-wrote 
every song almost. And so you said you didn't know how, you know, you never wrote a song before. So what is that like? And as far as, you know, you, you and Michelle writing the songs and writing the lyrics, did Gigi ever want to contribute lyrics or what was the decision to do it the way you did? Um, she was in the same boat as the rest of us. She, she had never really written before. So she was kind of green too. So I don't know. I, I just, I wasn't thinking much about, the lyrics and vocals and stuff. I just was so consumed with the guitar that all of that was an after effect. And that was the stuff that was probably fine tuned by the producers the, mo the most. I mean, our, our songs were really a mess. Mm -hmm. And Marty Friedman and Steve Fontano really did what producers do and kind of make sense of everything. Right. And because the gimmick of Phantom Blue obviously was, well, one that you're you're women, but you can play better than most men. And then at the same time, this this incredible uh, all of you at, at playing, but especially this dual guitar thing that really it had I don't think it had been done as far as women goes. And and shredding. It was really a shredding gimmick. So I'm not sure songs <laughs> were really the uh, the draw to Phantom Blue. Yeah. I, you, you nailed it, yeah. Um, and I think that's why when we got to California, Mike Barney had a song written for us by the producer, the, he, the one that we did the video for in the prison. Right, and so we got so we got to get into this. So I, I knew about this song, and I, I've heard about this video, and I said, okay, well, let me uh, let me do my research here, and. Uh, we're looking, by the way, we're looking at pictures uh, of Phantom Blue while you and I are chatting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just changing that now. So we're looking at the first album cover. So they, they decide that you guys need a commercial song and they bring in um, outside songwriter. And I believe he's he's Mike's partner, right? Or works um, with him? I think they work together. I think he was a, a Steve Fontano who has produced a lot of Mike's work. Mm -hmm. Um, I forgot the co-writer's name, but he was a colleague of Steve Fontano. Okay, so they, they write this song for you, and it's funny. So the song is kind of against what the Phantom Blue, forgive me for saying, gimmick is. Um, you know, I know. I, I hated it. I was pissed. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, no disrespect to Mike or anyone else, but it's not a very good song, in, in, my, in my opinion. And actually... It, it's a heart song. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, do you, I'm not sure. I'm sure you know that, and you probably knew that then. Yeah. Um, I can't. I'm not sure which one it was, but it's like as soon as I heard it, I go, "Well, this song has already been written." It's very, yeah. It's very cliche, and I knew that we would never be able to pull it off live. All those backing vocals and the keyboards. It's like, why are we doing this? We're not going to pull it off live. It's shit. So yeah, it wasn't. You know, if you're trying, I get it. Everyone wanted to have a ballad. Everyone wanted to have a commercial song, and I understand that. But I don't think that that song uh, was the one. And then, okay, so now we, we're full of bright ideas. The next idea is, well, let's take this all woman, female band, and put you in a uh, make a video in a prison. And so yeah, brilliant, right? <laughs> well, and watching the video was painful. It's painful. Pardon? The the video is painful. Not only it, does it not really hold up, it's so bizarre watching the these you know uh, half naked women playing a, a, in a men's in a men's prison. And this was a real. These guys were in there for life, and uh, and so I don't get it. I I think maybe they're trying to. If you're trying to put out a love song, it, it was the oddest message of these guys these guys around <laughs> the prison smoking and. And then I'm thinking, do these yeah. guys get like, uh, do they get an extra carton of smokes or something? Like it's, it almost seems exploitive, uh, you know. And so anyway, you tell it, me. It was so bizarre. I mean, we just kind of showed up. I mean, for some reason, my before they let us into enter the prison, they did FBI security checks on all of us. And for some reason that I don't know and still don't know, my FBI 
check didn't clear. So I had a personal guard assigned to me who followed me everywhere I went. That's and not a bad gig. There, you know, and it's just piss hot in Nevada. And they stick us and we're, we're in leather, high heels and all our hair is, you know, to the nines. And they parade us in front of these men and put us inside of a holding cell. And then you can see the men behind the bars watching us. You know, they haven't seen women, a woman in 10 years. And it's like just so weird. Mm, very weird. And uh, but listen, we should point out that you guys are young and you're trying to, you know, make it and you're working with people who have experience and you're probably thinking, well, I guess they know what's right. For the most part, if it was something that I didn't want to do, like the, the song in general, I would, you know, make a stink. But with the video, it was like, oh, yeah, cool. We got to do it. So just shut up and get it done. Right. I, mean, I had no vision for a video. I hated the song. So. Yeah. As and long as I didn't have to, you know, pay for it, let them do what they want to do. So. Well, they probably wanted you to pay for it in the long run. They, they probably would have liked to have, well, Roadrunner would have maybe liked to recoup what they invested in it. Maybe they did. I, I don't know. I doubt it. But. Well, and so, okay, so Shrapnel signs you guys and puts out the record originally, but then Roadrunner, uh, did they distribute it or how did they get involved? Yeah, they, they're Mike's European distributor, so they're the ones who put up the tour and the video money. So they really, if it wasn't for Roadrunner, we, we wouldn't have done much. And, you know, I'm here in Europe now, and it's such a different story how we went over in Europe as opposed to the States. Well, right. So the record comes out around 89, I believe. And then right. you, you guys go and do a three-month tour of Europe. And so tell me what it's like and what the uh, acceptance is. Well, it was crazy because we had no idea. I mean, we were used to, you know, playing in America where we, you had to pay people to show up to your, you know, your shows on the strip. Mm -hmm. And then we get to Europe and there's like lines of people waiting outside record stores to meet us. And we're like, shit, this is crazy. Um, and go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, you know, you had this fan base out there. Obviously Roadrunner promoted it. And, and, and sure, the, the, the gimmick that, okay, you're going to see these attractive women, but also you're going to see attractive women who can play incredibly well is probably working. And you, you guys have a, a, a fan base all of a sudden. Is it true at that time that you were actually autographing uh, men, like literally, like like men's? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. You were, you were, you were, um, you were signing genitals. It, well, it was at a show in London, our last show of the tour at the Marquee, and this dude just kept coming up with everything for me to sign a cigarette box. Just he had all this shit for me to sound like, what's next? You're dick. Mm -hmm. there. I won't say the word, but I think it's okay. We're all and adults. He's like, okay, well, and so he's like, well, yeah. And like, oh no, what have I done? So yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah. And you signed it. Well, yeah, I was gracious of you. He could put the cigarette box on eBay, but I'm not sure he can put his junk, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe he had it tattooed. I mean, I I'm assuming he showered. Well, maybe he maybe he tattooed it. You know, maybe this many years later, this guy wakes up in the morning and goes, "Oh my God, I still have Nicole Couch's signature." Yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> with that story, I, don't think I got the whole signature. <laughs> well, that's yeah, maybe initials, but uh, but anyway. So you're <laughs> there's so many jokes that we'll say for the unrated um, uh, edition. Right. But so, but anyway, so yeah, so you guys are doing well there and it's popular and you're signing records and playing shows. Um, were you traveling with another band or was it just you guys headlining? Um, there at some certain shows, there was another band. I don't remember them. My hmm. bandmates probably would. Right. But I know in Germany, we um, 
had a opening band and at one point we were opening for other people i just don't remember sure well it's a long time ago yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so okay so you come back from europe and what's it like probably disappointing in a lot of ways um yeah because we were coming back thinking we had a deal lined up with capital records hmm. and we came back and that fell through and it was like ah. Oh. Shit, it seems like we're right at square one. And we weren't about to go back to the strip and do that whole thing again. So then, miraculously, one day we're at our rehearsal in Redondo Beach, and Don Dockin walks into our rehearsal room. And he's like, Wow, you guys are really, well, you, you gals are really good. So then he kind of took over. Well, okay, and, and so like, at we should po- we should just point out uh, at this time Don Dawkins was had a solo record, um, I believe, on Geffen, and was taking yes. some yeah taking some time for Dawkins. But he was known for looking for bands. Uh, you know, he produced X Y Z, and I think a few other of the bands from that time. So okay, so go ahead. So Don shows some interest in you guys, gals. Yeah, he shows up to a rehearsal and he's like, "Okay, you're fat, you're fat, and you're fat, and you you all dress like slobs." So. He sent us all to a personal trainer in a gym and got us new clothes and gave us money to help us live. And he's like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get you into top shape. I'm going to help you, you know, smooth out some of the new material that you're writing. And we're going to have a showcase and we're going to get you a record deal. Like, yeah, sure. So that happened. And. It was funny the the night that he did all of that for us and decided, you know, and gave us money and stuff. We were all at the rainbow and someone bought me a gin and tonic, which I had one and I got in my car and I was following Gigi home, our singer. And she took a turn onto the 405 and I missed the turn and made a U-turn that was illegal there was a cop behind me and I tried to lose the cop and eventually gave up and he pulled me over and he's like, I smell alcohol. Have you been drinking? I said, I had one drink and he realized I was 18. So he's like, well, you know, you shouldn't have had one drink at your age. So he made me leave my car and he took me to the police station. I wasn't legally drunk, nothing. I blew well under the limit. Mm -hmm. And he decided to put me in jail for the night. So I called Don. I'm like, can you bail me out of jail? (laughs) So he comes to pick me up from Los Angeles County Jail at four in the morning. So anyhow, yeah, we all get in shape and lose weight and get nice clothes. And he gets our songs together. And I'm talking too much. (laughs) I'll shut up. No, no, I think this is I think this is interesting. You know, um, to call one of the things I have to say, when you're researching a band like Phantom Blue, there, there's some information, but there's not tons out there. And you don't do many of these things. Obviously, you've been living a private life. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I also think it's interesting that Don Dawkins is sort of trying to manufacture a band. Not that that's an uncommon thing to do. It's a business. Um, but right. so I think it's I think it's interesting that, that Don's got you guys in the gym and is working on the songs. <laughs> <laughs> it really worked out well. I'm going to tell you a good story about and that that's very similar, but I got to tell you when we get off the air. Can't, I can't tell it publicly. Okay. It's, it's similar. So, uh, okay, so what, where does it go next? So we all get in shape and get our songs polished, and we have this big showcase at the Roxy, and... Tom Zutat is there and a couple of other labels who I really don't remember. And we played our butts off. And then Tom asked us all out for dinner in Hollywood. And he's like, well, I really like you guys. Let's, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time that that happened, we had a um, A A&R woman at Capitol records 
who was leaving Capitol for Hollywood Records, which was Disney's new label. Mm -hmm. And she took her interest in us over to Hollywood Records. So it was just this toss up, uh, Geffen, you know, the big label of the time or Hollywood, Disney, all the money. I mean, literally, Michael Eisner called me and Gigi one day at home, and I answered the phone in my stupid fake Japanese voice. Hello? And he's like, yes, this is Michael Eisner. I'm like, oh, well, shit. <laughs> that's, that's pretty insane. And yeah. he's like, yeah, we even met him and shook his hand. He's like, we will, you know, give you whatever you want. We really would like to work with you. I'm like, look, you give me lifetime passes to Disney. Mm-hmm. We can talk. So, yeah, so now I, then, I, yeah, go ahead. Why doesn't this not work out? Um, Because I'm stupid and have a big mouth. So Don at the time, as you had mentioned, was working with Zutat for his solo album. And I think Tom was a little stretched then between all the different bands he was working with. And Don wasn't getting the attention that he needed and deserved. And so Don said to us, you know, you're better to go with Hollywood. And because Tom won't have the time for you. And stupid me repeated that to Tom. And Zutat wasn't stupid and was, you know, got mad at Don. And then Don got mad at me. He's like, Nikki, you're a, I won't say the word, but he was the first person to ever call me. C C word? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> he just walks in the rehearsal room. I'm sitting behind my amp knowing that I had fucked up and he's like, Nikki, you're a Right. He dropped it. he dropped a C bomb, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I deserved it though. So it was kind of like if we don't sign with Geffen, they're you know gonna her Don, which we didn't want to do to, to, to do that because he had really been a huge help to us. Sure. So. And he gave we you very good. Ev- he gave you very good advice that, but you threw him under the bus. You know, obviously not intentionally, because yeah, you, you never right. say no to the mouse. Disney comes knocking. That, you know, and and Don's even behind it. But listen, you're young, you're young, and this is new and overwhelming. And you probably think, and maybe I'm wrong. You probably think we're in high demand. And actually, you were. So you're probably thinking it's going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we figured, you know, it could be worse. We could have no interest. Mm-hmm. And so. And, I mean, it was, it was a huge thought to think that someone would buy our contact contract from Shrapnel, you know. Right. So. Yeah. And, and so this is where it's going to start to get interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting already, but the million dollar question is, 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 is coming up. And so, so you guys decide to go with Geffen. Are, um, are you still in the band when that contract is signed? Yes, I was still in the band at the time. Is it true? I... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, is it true that that was a seven album contract? Yes, it was seven albums. That sounds insane. Doesn't it for the time? I think for any you know, time. Se- seven albums, you know, um, that's really tying you up, obviously, too. Um, did you have any fear or did you just figure, well, hell, that's seven albums? Um, my fear was the, the pressure that I knew I was under to write. And... The, I knew that the song writing had to change because I, I we were on a Zoot. I don't know why, but Zuta kind of pushed this idea that he wanted us to be, you know, the next Guns N' Roses, which is impossible mm-hmm. because, you know, we weren't that. And at the time, I was heavily into Guns N' Roses and Axel as a songwriter. So I had changed completely and really began writing more lyrically and, you know, concentrating more on vocals. And it was a huge pressure to get all that done. I mean, Michelle was awesome at coming up with guitar licks, but she kind of had 
a tin ear and wasn't much of a vocal writer. So that was my thing to do. So it was just a, a lot of fear, like, oh, how am I going to do this? At one point, I, I said to Tom, I need to go home to Memphis for a couple of weeks because I'm having writer's block. So Geffen paid for me to go home to Memphis, and I didn't write a single thing, so I was kind of freaking out. Yeah, well, so one of the things also is that as popular as shrapnel was amongst guitar players and fans of fast guitar, none of those artists really went on to have a major label career that I can think of. You know, Paul Gilbert might have been Mr. Big later, but... Um, Right. I don't think that those bands, you know, again, no disrespect to Mike because the, 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 there were some amazing records, but that they were not songs that were going to get played on MTV. You know, the gimmick of Phantom Blue was right. this, how talented you are and how fast you play. But I can understand, okay, we're going to Geffen, who at the time has Guns N' Roses, and you're thinking, we got to have some better songs to do this. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I wanted better songs. I kind of had changed. I mean, I had always been someone who sat down at a piano and I mean, I like melody. And so I, I wanted better songs. Okay. So he, so here it is. Either you made the smartest decision, the bravest decision or the craziest decision, but for some reason, and you're going to tell us you choose to leave fandom blue. Yeah, that, that was such a weird time, you know. Um, I was doing all this writing, and maybe I mentioned earlier, when I first started playing, I was singing, probably terribly. And um, the more I really focused on writing vocals for all these songs that we were putting out, I'm like, shit, I want to sing this stuff, but I suck. And we had Gigi Hangyak, which, you know, really, she's one of the best. Yeah. So I just kind of put that dream aside. And then I started missing my family. My mother had gotten remarried, and I had two young half-sisters. And so, I don't know, maybe I was, I don't know. I just kind of lost interest in the whole thing and really wanted to do something else. I really, I swear, I wanted to sit down at a piano and sing the shit that I was writing and just take a different path in music. I didn't want to stand on stage playing guitar anymore. And during that era, after we had signed with Geff and we were still playing out at smaller clubs in LA, not in the strip. And I just hated it. And I would just stand there pouting like a jerk. And my band was like, what is wrong with you? And I really couldn't explain it. So I just thought, well, it's better off that I just leave. I feel like so there has I, to be some more to that because, because you, you, uh, you know, you work so hard to get this break. And again, you're young. But well, you were young and hungry at the time. You get this deal that would seem like the biggest deal in the world, seven records with Geffen. And were you getting along with everybody in the band? Yeah, everything was fine that wise. I, I, I was kind of missing Michelle Meldrum, who was my best friend throughout this whole period. She had met John Norm during that time through Dokken, of course. Right. John so, was with Dokken. John Norm from the band so, Europe. Was Don Dawkins' yeah, guitar right. player? No, well, he Europe, yeah. yeah. He was playing with Don at the time, so they met. Yeah, he was on Don's of course, solo record and then solo tour, right, right. after Europe. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So they were head over heels, you know, for each other. And I mean, it's normal that you're going to see less of your best buddy when they find someone. So that it was just like a combination of everything. It's like, God, you know, I just want to go home and be with my little sisters and play piano and just does anyone tell you you're crazy you're making a mistake you got to figure it out um no no one said that um 
Because, you know, I guess when I thought about going home and changing my course, I didn't think that it would be over, you know. I kind of knew Phantom Blue would be over, but I kind of felt like, I kind of felt like the whole thing with Geffen was something that would be pulled out from underneath us anyhow, because I don't, it just seemed like there was um, like really no idea what to do with us. I mean, like I told, I told you, I knew that Zutat was kind of full of shit when he was like, you're going to be the next Guns N' Roses. That, that was not going to happen. So like the, the money part, you know, seven records, you know, the big album advance and everything was kind of cool, but the rest of it just seemed like this isn't really going to go anywhere. So, well, and, and to be honest, you were correct. Um, there was a lot of problems to come after you left. Um, but also, you know, we should point out that you did write or co-write every song on the album um, that was released through Geffen yeah. as well. And and so, and what is that like to you? How, how do you feel that, okay, they're going to use my, my songs? Um, when I left, I was on good, good terms with everyone. And the deal was that I will, you know, play on the album when that comes. And then I get a call one day in Memphis. I think I'm already pregnant at the time with my daughter. Okay. And the, and it was like, no, you're not going to be playing on the album. They hadn't brought in anyone new yet, but they they took everything back that was decided before I left. You're not going to play on the album. So, well, then you're going to have to figure out something you know, you're, you're using my songs. I just co-wrote the, the entire album with Michelle. So I was kind of a jerk and demanded money mm -hmm. from Geffen up front. And I think Geffen at that point, after, you know, I demanded money for my songs, they're like, this band is just trouble. So they, they, they paid me, but then they, um, the band, I guess, had to sue Ge Geffen to actually put them in the studio because they weren't going to even record the album. So, But I, I don't think those problems ensued because I had left. Well, you said that you got pregnant um, shortly after. Did, you, did a relationship have anything to do with it or that's just coincidental? Yeah, coincidental. Yeah. Yeah. You you got you went back home and and that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I, yeah. I I don't think that it's your fault that things didn't go well with Geffen, and you know, it is a thing in the industry where people sign up anything, and maybe somebody had Vixen, and they said we better get something similar. You, you, you know, things like this. Uh, or who? I'm just using yeah. them as an example. Um, so yeah, and you know, sure. In in the long run, you probably you were right. You know, you, you made a brave decision, but it didn't work out. Um, I mean, other people would say, yo, you probably, you know, you, you ran away from it or, you know, I'm sure that everybody ha would have a different version, but you had to follow your heart and make that brave decision. Yeah, I, I didn't even know what it was, you know, I, I wasn't sure what they wanted to do with us. So they go through management problems. They go through legal problems. Uh, and right. they did try to keep together different versions of Phantom Blue for quite some time. Linda McDonald, the drummer, who is also the drummer for the Iron Maidens um, now, yeah. she kept it going until I believe 2001 or something like, you know, in different. And at one point she would be the only original member. Did you ever have yeah. any thoughts on that or did you, were you in contact? Um, I was, you know, after Michelle died and I looked at the Phantom Blue, um, website i was kind of mad not at linda but it was like this is not michelle's band this is a tribute band there's no integrity left um and i just felt that after the founding members had left it's just time to call it quits and it was just it was cheap but you know linda loves to play and she loves, you know, 
she loved the band, so I wasn't upset. I just thought that it got, you know, that the horse was beat to death. Right, yeah. Um, I think people were looking for things and the name had, you know, some interest. And so, you know, you put out different versions. Obviously she found right. something that works, you know, much better for her now. Um, let's, yeah. let's talk about Michelle a little bit. So she moved mm-hmm. overseas with, with John Norm. They were married. Um, and did you stay in contact with her at all? I did. We, we, um, at the, at the time the internet really wasn't, you know, social media and all that, but eventually we hooked up on MySpace. And at one point we were going to hang out again in California and we just, I was busy with kids and we just never hooked up. So, but we were always in contact on MySpace. Yeah. And, and so for those who don't know, Michelle passed away. Um, what was her death? Uh, it was a sudden thing, wasn't it? Um, I, I was in Memphis at the time and I get a message from a friend on MySpace, and he's like, Michelle is in a coma. I'm like what? Shit. Well, that's better than dead. So I went to work just sad, praying, just, just really down. And then I came home from work and he's like, she's gone. And then I think I talked to Linda and Linda was like, she um, had fallen asleep with a headache and just went unconscious and never woke up. And her parents had to pull the plug. So it was just terribly sad. Yeah, I, I really, uh, t- you know, obviously, like you said, a terrible thing. Um, and so there, at that point, pe- they're, they're, the idea is to sort of do tributes to Michelle and um, there is an idea to put Phantom Blue back together for shows um, as a tribute to her. And, and so did you do any of those? No. Um, gosh, I skipped a good uh, few years here. But at, at the point, um, I had just, God, my memory is so bad. But when she died... I'm trying to put together the chronological order of everything. It's just scattered. Mm -hmm. But I just wasn't in a position financially to where I could get back to L.A. and take off work and all that stuff. So, no, I didn't do it. And it just kind of seemed like, I mean, Linda's intentions were good because she was a great friend of Michelle. But it, it seemed like the main thing was to promote the Iron Maidens, which, you know, fine, whatever. But it didn't seem like it was much of a remembrance of Michelle and Phantom Blue and all this and that. So, and I couldn't do it financially. So I just didn't do it. Yeah. So, so you, so you sat it out and I believe um, Courtney Cox, not from friends, yeah, but Courtney. from she did, yeah. yeah. And everybody, you know, said it was just awesome, and the objective was met. You know, they had a tribute show for her. They raised money right. for her son, and it, it it worked out well. So it doesn't even matter that I didn't even show up. You know, my 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 heart was there, but just my physical presence wasn't. So of course, yeah, and so, um. Which so and it's a good thing that they they were able to raise that money. Did you ever play with the the the, the, um, the women from Phantom Blue again? I feel like you did do one of these shows. Um, at some point, I was called by Linda to do a small tour with them of in Europe because their guitar player who replaced me had hurt her leg or something. Hmm. And I got sick. And at at this point, I was living in New York City. I don't know what year it was, but I had come down with pneumonia and just didn't do it. So 
So, you, but did you did you ever do one of these jams in LA? I thought you did something with them. No, never. I've never played with them again. Gotcha. So after when you left, you really left. Yeah. Um, and but you were going to do the Europe thing if you could. I, I was, but I got really sick. What? And my daughter at the time was like two or three, so. And, it was just too much to and, think about. Yeah, sure. And what you do as a guitar player is not the kind of thing where you can just put the guitar down and pick it up and, you know, jump back in. No. It, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a, a skill, but also a muscle, you, you know, to play that kind of stuff. So I'm sure it's not. Yeah, I kind of panicked when they said, you know, this tribute show. I'm like, oh, fuck, I better start practicing. Yeah. Um, so... Now you're living in New York and let's talk about your health. Um, and you can tell me the year, but at some point that you have a stroke. Um, oh God, yeah, I had a stroke. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about I that. Was, pardon? So tell me about what, what happened. I you know to this day, I still don't know what happened. I wasn't, you know, I, I'm a very healthy person. I've never had a drug or a drinking problem. I quit smoking in my early twenties. I had this great job where I was doing musical theater for little kids, just really running around a room with a guitar and a headset, singing, playing guitar. Great job. And I came home one night, and was on my computer doing a spreadsheet for my boss and just got confused all of a sudden and couldn't turn my computer off and thought, well, I'll just go to sleep and try to stand up and fell. And I woke up in the emergency room the next morning, half paralyzed on my left side of all sides, my guitar player hand. Like, damn. And the doctor's like, you've had a stroke. And I had brain surgery. And so, yeah, that was just bad luck. Yeah, well, and, and you, were, you were left legally blind at that point yes yeah i lost 50 percent of my peripheral vision so i don't work so you're so in, in a way yeah good it was kind of good luck in a way i um some some good things came came out of it i began to um volunteer for disabled classes like doing music therapy so that is probably something I would have never found an opportunity to get involved in had this not had, had happened. And then I, um, this is where it gets really weird and confusing. This is where it but gets in, weird. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in London, I met someone who I don't remember at the marquee, the same place where I was signing male body parts. And I get this message from this guy on Facebook one day. He's like, I met you at the marquee. I'm like, oh shit, it's him. But it wasn't him. It was it was this fan who had come from France to see us play. And he had pictures of us. And he was really sweet. And he's like, come visit me in France. You know, I've got three daughters, so. I visited him in France. Wait, hold on, hold on. This is this is the biggest <laughs> news of all. So you're saying this that works? <laughs> so I'm just making a quick quick note. So so people can write to you on Facebook, and you you'll come out to France. Okay. So so I, you, you you listen. You probably thought he was a nice guy, harmless, and you for whatever reason you were ready to go to France. So go on. Yeah. So I did. I I got on a plane to visit France and it's great <laughs> and it worked out. So I'm still here. Yeah. Well, and so, and okay. So you're living in Fr France. How long have you been there? Three years. Do you speak French? Uh, do you speak French? No, God, no, I really, I, I'm terrible with language because the, the vision problems that I've had since the stroke also present a reading disability. So and I've really spent the past three years playing guitar and piano 24-7, which is nice. 
it's kind of, I mean, it, it sucks not having a job because hmm. you kind of lose track of what's what. Oh, it's like, okay, well, it's, yeah, what day is today? Oh, yeah, right. It's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Well, and at some point you thought you might not be able to play again, right? Yeah. Um, because that after. I couldn't snap my, snap my fingers and it's like, ah, oh, this is just shit. So, so yeah, so it's, it, you're fortunate that you've been able to play. And uh, so you're, you're working on, on music again, right? I am. I, if, it, if it wasn't for COVID, I would have an EP ready to go. I've been writing for the past three years, and I finally, um, that, that job that I told you about right before I had my stroke, uh, was a job that really forced me to get my voice in shape. And I was singing every genre from blues to pop to rock and roll. So I really developed the rock voice that I had always wanted. So I'm ready to go for that, but I don't, I, you know, you can't travel right now. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, I'm, and I, I'm just too stupid and too blind to operate recording equipment. Um, so, well, you know, yeah, what, you, you, now that you say that someone will go on Facebook and message you and you, you, they'll figure that out for you. But what, what, <laughs> what type of music are you playing? Are you shredding? Um, that, that's going to be in there. It's part of it because it's just something that I was so excited to regain the skill to do again. Mm hmm so there, the, the shredding will be a part of it, but it will not be shred-oriented music. There, it will be more, I mean, honestly, I am so into, like, what I didn't tap into my early influences, like Maiden. <laughs> I mean, that that's really what I grew up listening to, not Racer X. And I could kick myself for not, like, tapping into that creatively. Well, you're so it, it will be more technical oriented rock, but not so shrapnel shreddy. Sure. But the shred will be there. Right. You can incorporate shredding and, and, and fast playing and solos into good songs yeah. as well. That's the intent, yeah. Plus there's a lot of piano because piano really is my true love. And yeah. that's what I wanted to do is sit down at the piano and you know, be an Elton John knockoff, you know, or Freddie Mercury. So are you probably gonna? Are you in? Are you in touch with anyone from your past? The, if for, for you know any of these people that we talked about? Um, I talked to Mike because I um, needed a letter from him because I had, was thinking about going back to school at GIT and doing their vocal program. So I talked to Mike. Um, occasionally I talk to the band members, but we're, you know, all on different levels. It's just weird. Well, and you have different lives and it's been a long time as well. I mean, yeah, and we're all far apart, so. Yeah, and, and that's where social media comes in, you know, where you can yeah um, say hello and things. So, so Nicole, where can people, uh, besides writing on Facebook, <laughs> Where can people find you? Do you have a website? Um, I have an e-artist artist card website, but I guess through Messenger, Facebook. Okay, well, I'll link. Is the easiest way. Yeah, and I'll link the e-artist card um, below. And uh, and so hopefully, you know, I think, uh, you know, that when things start to open up again here in the world, and it seems like that hopefully will happen soon, there'll be more options and there'll be some time for you to, to finish um, an EP of music. I hope, gosh. And, and, you know, like you said, you've been using this time though, you know, writing and, and doing things that maybe you wouldn't have had the time to do otherwise. Right, exactly. I would be in, you know, I would be having to work in nine to five jobs. So it was a stroke of luck, pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, 
so anyway, people could look for, for that. I'm really glad you did this. I think there's a lot of people who had questions. You know, the first time I saw Phantom Blue, I saw the hard and heavy uh, VHS tape. And, uh, and, I, and I saw you guys, you and Michelle, standing uh, you know, out on the street. It looked like, you know, Sunset Boulevard or whatever. Uh, and you're talking about how, how broke you guys are. And you're wearing a, a Budweiser, <laughs> a Budweiser T-shirt. <laughs> And I said, this, this girl's hot. I don't think you can say that these days without getting canceled. But, <laughs> but then I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to listen to their, I'm going to listen to her guitar playing. And then, and I think for most people, you go, oh, wow, this, this hot girl who's selling, you know, office supplies at the time and, and, and uh, can really play, you know, and I think that, it, that, that, I think a lot of people might've discovered the band that way. Yeah, that was a really cool video. And anyway, so yeah, so and and then all that's all everything we've talked about is on YouTube. So you can go watch that. You can go make fun of the jail video. Uh, you know, I got to ask the if, male body parts is on. Well, just us talking about it, and I learned that the hard way. I was actually a school teacher, teaching like you know like a real serious job teaching K through twelve. And I didn't even know YouTube existed. I was living on a boat in the middle of the Caribbean. And one of my students comes up to me one day and is like, ah, couch, your videos are all over YouTube. I'm like, what? And then one of my students' mothers was like, yes, I, I saw you talking about what you did at shows in London. I was like, ah, oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you, would, uh, you, you never thought that that would follow you this long. Uh, and so what, and what about your family? Are the, the kids uh, grown up now? How old are your kids? My daughter is 30. She is wow, working 30? for a senator. 30, yeah. How do you have a 30-year-old kid? It's insane. I was, I think I was in my early 20s. So she's working for mid, a senator. Mid-20s. She's working for a senator in Washington. How wild. So. I don't know exactly what she does, but she's she's a real political ball buster, so she's happy. Yeah, and what about your son? My son, he is leaving for the Air Force in June. So, so yeah, so you're you, you're uh, you're ready to start your life again. <laughs> yeah, you did your parenting. <laughs> They're good kids. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, thank you for joining me, Nicole. Really had fun. And I think people will really get a kick out of this and, 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 and learn something new. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Nicole Couch, she plays guitar for a band called Phantom Blue. <laughs> yes. Well, but now, but now they know uh, a lot more than that. All right, Nicole. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it.